So welcome to the start of our lecture series. Our lecture series, that means the lecture series of the Center for IT Impact Studies at the University of Tartu within the Institute for Political Studies. My name is Robert Krimmer, I'm Professor of eGovernance, and I'm very happy to welcome uh, now our first speaker on our lecture series on issues in digital governance. And our first speaker is actually professor, our visiting professor for governance in the digital age, Vincent Homburg. Um, as he is a current visiting professor with us, he is also an associate professor of public administration in Erasmus University of Rotterdam. And in his research, he focuses on e-government, both as a national phenomenon in the Netherlands, as well as also for comparative research, meaning uh, between different country experiences. Uh, Vincent has published more than 60 peer-reviewed articles and chapters on public management and information systems. He also co-edited the Information Ecology of e-Government with iOS Press and the New Public Management in Europe Adaptation and Alternatives with Palgrave Macmillan. He also offered Understanding e-Government, Information Systems and Public Administration. Professor Omberg has been cited over 2,700 times, uh, according to Google Scholar, and has a Hirsch Index of 22. Um, I also should not uh, forget that he was uh, awarded with the John Stewart Prize for Best Paper in Local Government Studies and was in 2015 the nominee for the Erasmus University of Rotterdam Education Award. And with that, I have the great honor to give you the floor, Vincent, so that you can tell us a bit more about uh, Cosmic's comparative study of social media in citizen-state relations. Vincent, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to present my work in the uh, public lecture series. So indeed, I'm going to talk about COSMICS. And as you can see, uh, it's an acronym for the Comparative Study of Social Media and Citizen State Relations. And well, like many acronyms that are being used to describe research projects, it is slightly incorrect, but I, I liked the term COSMICS anyway. So let's, uh, let's keep on using it. Um, uh, Robert has already introduced me. Uh, I can, uh, I will not uh, spend too much time on introducing myself, uh, other than uh, saying that uh, I, I indeed uh, have worked in the field of e-government slash public management slash public administration for uh, years, and I have contributed to the field. I also contributed to uh, articles in the Journal of Nursing Management, uh, the International Education, Education Journal, the Journal of Cleaner Production, and the Journal of Public Affairs Education, um, which uh, suggests that I have severe difficulties of um, staying within, the, within disciplinary boundaries. And that's another way of saying that I really like multidisciplinary work. And indeed, uh, so since September the 1st, I've been a visiting professor at the Yon Shita Institute. Uh, I very much like it, and I now divide my time between Tartu and Rotterdam, or Dordrecht, slightly south of Rotterdam, where I live. Um, let's start with introducing the topic of my talk, uh, which basically is social media. Um, and more particularly, social media in politics or social media in relations between citizens and governments. Um, I would like to claim that over the past years or even decades, we have seen many situations in which social media are being used for all kinds of political activities and political, political participation. Um, and as an example, I would like to mention the uh, initiative in Iceland in 2012, where social media were being used for crowdsourcing of ideas for a new constitution. Uh, so social media were not the only communication channel, but it was one of the communication channels that were used to um, uh, allow citizens to speak up, uh, to um, uh, gather and share and discuss ideas. Um, and this, this was quite an uh, interesting experiment, I would say. Um, oh, furthermore, it has been observed that uh, social media played an important role 
in circumventing traditional media in, for example, Turkey and uh, uh, Egypt, um, and allowed for protests in the streets. Although, well, the, the role for social media is being disputed, uh, but also in more day-to-day -day activities, uh, we see that citizens are turning to social media to raise their voice, to uh, suggest ideas, to ask for attention, uh, and at least to also to reach out to governments to address specific issues. Now, for the remainder of my talk, I would like to make uh, a basic distinction between thick and thin participation. Um, thick participation relates to the kind of political participation that, that addresses big political issues like uh, drafting the constitution, like talks about climate change, immigration, energy transitions, and so on. Thin, to, thin participation, on the other hand, relates more to the participation of citizens regarding day-to-day -day, uh, uh, issues that they may encounter. Uh, in many cases, this has to do with situations of poor public service quality performance. Uh, for instance, uh, what you see on the top right, uh, a report on potholes, and this will come back later in my talk. Um, and in the remainder of my talk, I will more uh, I will focus more on uh, thin participation, so more the day-to-day -day political activity of citizens online when they reach out to government. At this moment, um, I would like to claim that social media provide ample opportunities for both thick and thin political participation. And may, we may even uh, claim that there is a virtual public sphere uh, that is available to us. Okay, so this is a rather optimistic and perhaps techno-optimistic view of what we are uh, witnessing at this moment. Now, there may also be a reason to be slightly more critical. Um, and there are other interpretations of what is going on in relation to social media and political participation. Um, and in order to illustrate some of the alternative interpretations, I would like to give the floor to two of the starkest critics of social media at this moment. Those are uh, Susanna Zuboff, a retired professor from Harvard Business School, and Frances Horgan. Um, and she is a, a former uh, Facebook product manager. Um, but let's first uh, turn to uh, Professor Zuboff. Uh, she was the author, she is the author of the 1988 book, In the Age of the Smart Machine. And well, uh, more relevant in this context, um, she published uh, the book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism in 2018. And uh, let's hear what she has to say about the role of social media in politics and society. If you look at a company like uh, Google, or you look at a company like Facebook, these folks have accrued extraordinary power. Uh, a man like Mr. Zuckerberg, who has absolute control over Facebook, now essentially has absolute control over critical communications infrastructure that involves billions of people. And there is no countervailing force, no countervailing power uh, when it comes to Mr. Zuckerberg and his decision rights. So we have this uh, communication space that is no longer a public sphere. It's a public sphere is the essential context when we talk about free speech. And a few years ago, experts, academic researchers understood that false inflammatory information circulates more widely and is more widely engaged with than true, good, <laughs> uh, normal, common sense information. So you see that Zubo questions whether social media can uh, play a role uh, in a public sphere, or it could be a, 
an integral part of the public sphere in society because, well, uh, there are important uh, businesses behind social media. And how this actually may work um, is uh, exemplified by uh, Francis Horgan. And Francis Horgan uh, is, a, again, is a former Facebook product manager who uh, resigned in May of this year. Uh, and she, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, she, she, she became quite famous, at least in the last months. So um, it, I think it was right, about two weeks ago, she um, uh, appeared, uh, she, she uh, testified in a, in a Senate committee, the Senate Commerce Committee, about some of the practices and operations that Facebook uses in its operation. And I will now give the floor to uh, Francis Horgan. Grab your phone. You might see only 100 pieces of content if you sit and scroll off for you know, five minutes. But Facebook has thousands of options it could show. And one of the consequences of how Facebook is picking out that content today is it is optimizing for content that gets engagement or reaction. But its own research is showing that content that is hateful, that is divisive, that is polarizing, it's easier to inspire people to anger than it is to other emotions. Facebook has realized that if they change the algorithm to be safer, people will spend less time on the site, they'll click on less ads, they'll make less money. Okay, so both speakers uh, seem to emphasize the political characteristics of this new channel of communication, of these new social media platforms. Uh, and these characteristics, the way these channels are being run, are being managed, may mold, shape, and amplify the tone and contents of the communications that are going on. And also, well, the, 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 kind, the kind of uh, uh, participation and political communication that is going on. So it is at least possible to question whether social media platforms are in fact uh, a part of, or uh, they, they, they shape the, the public sphere because the channel itself and the way it is managed has political qualities. And so, well, the, the conclusion that may be drawn from these comments is that this, this, this um, uh, mechanism of engagement-based ranking, this may increase polarization and therefore undermine democracy rather than enable other forms of democracy. And this was kind of the starting point for the research I would like to introduce to you. So uh, what we see, um, is that social media are a new technological opportunity that emerged as a new platform for political participation, but at the same time, and a bit also in defense of uh, big tech companies, social media were never actually designed to, to serve the purpose of political participation. And well, because of a number of the, the, the mechanisms that were introduced by, uh, by Shoshana Zuboff and um, uh, Francis Horgan, um, the idea of a social media public sphere may be questioned. So this is the, the broader context of the research. What we did in the, the research is that we tried to, ex try to explain why also, given this context, both governments, but more particularly citizens, would adopt, would start to use social media for reasons of political participation. And I would like to claim that there is a, a quite exhaustive, quite extensive literature on why governments adopt social media for reasons of service delivery, interactive policy making, and reaching out to citizens. Uh, and I can give you a very short uh, sneak preview of this literature. It's a, it's a selection, but well, uh, at, at least the claim at this moment is that there is literature. The other observation is that there is hardly literature on why citizens in, the, in this context that I introduced would use social media for interaction with governments or for political participation. And um, I uh, can demonstrate 
uh, or back this claim by referring to a uh, structured literature review uh, that was published in 2017, where uh, as a result of uh, a, a structured uh, search and discussion of the literature, this, um, uh, this was also observed. So this is kind of the, um, uh, the, the, the gap in the literature that we tried to address. Um, at the same time, so uh, Medaglia and Zeng said in 2017 that there is hardly any literature on why citizens would use social media for political participation. Um, in fact, at the same time, I was involved in an other research project where we tried to address this particular issue and this particular topic. Uh, but it was in a slightly unexpected context. Um, so um, uh, in about 2017, uh, together with Rebecca Moody, Xiaomei Young and Victor Beckers, I was involved in a study on the adoption of Weibo. So this is the, the Chinese uh, Twitter, you could say, by some Chinese citizens for interaction with governments. Um, and uh, what we try to do is to identify the variables that explain citizens' social media use to interact with government in, in this case, uh, uh, China, more particularly Hunan province. You can see on the map where Hunan is located. Um, and uh, basically, we uh, implemented a survey, we gathered information about people's intentions to use social media to reach out to governments, to uh, all kinds of governments for all kinds of, uh, for all kinds of purposes. Um, and we tried to explain uh, why some people did it and why other citizens refrained from doing so. And we came up with a number of uh, findings. So we found out that um, actually the most important predictor for people to reach out and use social media in China, in Hunan, to reach out to government was their trust in individual civil servants. So if they trusted civil servants, they would uh, more likely uh, use social media to uh, interact with government than if they didn't trust individual civil servants. Also, peer pressure play, played an important role in explaining uh, the adoption of uh, social media, as well as anxiety. So the idea that their activities, uh, citizens' activities online would potentially backfire on, uh, on them. More, the more generic idea of trust in government institutions was not found to be significantly predicting the adoption of Weibo to interact with government. Now, we uh, wrote a paper about it. It was, uh, uh, it's now available on the website of uh, the International Review of Administrative Sciences. Uh, um, uh, will be published. So it was accepted in 2018 or 19, I think. Will be available uh, in 2022. Uh, so, well, this was the, the China study. It says something about, um, if, you, if you look at these variables, so trust plays an important role, peer pressure plays an important role, also anxiety plays an important role. This kind of signals that um, individual citizens anticipate on some of the political characteristics of these channels of communication of social media platforms, because otherwise there would be there would be no reason to assume that trust is important. Also, what you could uh, interpret, trust in persons, peer pressure, anxiety, this could be consistent with the Chinese uh, characteristic of Guangxi, of intimate, the, the importance of interpersonal relations in explaining why they use adoption. Maybe you could also 
uh, infer that, well, the authoritarian context is important because of anxiety. But basically we don't know because we only looked at the situation in Hunan province. Uh, we didn't compare it to other contexts. So we, we, we can't claim that, oh, it's, it's because of the context that uh, it is happening it's like this. So were we satisfied and happy? No, we were happy with the publication, but in this study, there were a lot of limitations. So it was a, a study in China uh, and China has a big government. So citizen state relations or citizen government relations are also huge. It can cover a, a, a whole variety of topics and issues. Uh, so it may be true for China, but it's very hard to, to, to extrapolate these findings to other contexts. More particularly, it is uh, limited to Hunan province. And Hunan province uh, sounds like a, a very odd place, uh, but it has the same size, the same area as the United Kingdom, same population size as Italy. Well, but nevertheless, it's Hunan. So it's, it's limited. It, it may be a very specific situation. And we may, we may uh, interpret that the authoritarian context in this study uh, may play a role because of anxiety, but basically we don't know. So we came up with the actual cosmics uh, research design. So we wanted to know more about whether this context, the, 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 the level of democracy or the degree to which a country or context is authoritarian, plays a role in the way people adopt social media for interaction with governments. Um, furthermore, we wanted to focus a bit more on very specific interactions. So again, in the China study, it covered a whole range of interactions because, well, uh, again, it, China has a big government, but we wanted to, for, for making a fair comparison, uh, we wanted to, to focus a bit more on very specific interactions that could be relevant across a whole range of contexts. So we focused on thin participation. So the kind of interaction with respect to uh, public service quality on issues that could be confronted by citizens around the world. Uh, so there uh, we focused on thin participation. The third characteristics, what we uh, uh, tried to accomplish is that we um, uh, didn't uh, want to do a, a general survey but rather to introduce a vignette survey and to um, present respondents with very specific situations. So we knew that they responded to the same situations and not to situations that may be irrelevant for the context in which they live. And this is where the Cosmics Research uh, Project um, started and how it looked like. So I did this, uh, and I should have said this before, together with my colleague from Rotterdam, Rebecca Moody. We focused very much on citizens in, uh, in, uh, in, their, in their relation to governments and how citizens may or may not use social media to interact with governments. And basically we were, interested in finding out the answer to the question, which variables explain citizens' adoption of social media to initiate interaction with governments in relation to public service quality issues, so thin participation, and uh, in, in, in comparison, implying we uh, studied it in four democratic countries and four authoritarian countries. As theoretical backgrounds, we used more or less general generic adoption and diffusion theories, which are used to explain why people adopt technologies. Uh, and we complemented that with theories on trust, 
in institutions. Again, we picked up the relevance of trust from uh, uh, well discussions about social media and political parties, but also from this study in China. Um, as countries, we selected eight countries, four countries, uh, uh, four relatively democratic uh, countries from four continents, and uh, from the same continents, also four less democratic context, contexts. Um, and here you see the, the, uh, the selection of countries. So from Europe, we took the Netherlands and Greece, from the Americas, Canada and Paraguay, from Africa, Algeria and Kenya, and from Asia, China and Pakistan. Now, the, 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 the basis for the comparison uh, was an existing measure for um, uh, democracy. And we took it from the Economist, the Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index. So that's an index that measures the level of uh, democracy in various countries. It consists of five dimensions. So electoral process, the functioning of government, political participation, political culture, and civil liberties. And the scores you will find in the tables. So you see that this is the basis for the, for the comparison. Um, the way we, so in, in these kind of studies, um, in social media studies, you see that uh, in many cases, researchers use uh, content analysis of uh, social media uh, accounts to more or less quantitatively describe or analyze what is being discussed. Now, we thought that this was not an appropriate angle for our study because such an approach wouldn't say anything about why people would use, would use social media to engage in participation. And also, more particularly, it would not give any information on why people would uh, refrain from using social media to speak up. And therefore, we. Uh, we decided to choose a different approach. Uh, we used a vignette survey. Um, so we presented in a, in a questionnaire, we presented respondents with four vignettes in which a person, so it's a short description, in which a person, a protagonist, uh, in this case, we call the protagonist Rebecca, uses social media to publicly report a specific issue that he or she is confronted with. And the vignette, in each of the four vignettes, uh, a specific issue is described. So it can either be a pothole that he or she uh, uh, observes in, in a public road, something that went wrong with a request for a renewal of a passport, a tax mistake that was made, and a missed vaccination summon. So these are situations that citizens all over the world could be confronted with. And we, um, we tried to, we indeed measured the adoption of social media by asking three questions in a survey that all had to do with the, uh, the, the, the resemblance of the, the own position, whether respondents would have done the same as the protagonist, Rebecca in this example, in the vignette. Um, so that, is, that was our way of measuring the adoption of social media in, gov in citizen government relations. We also measured, and this, we thought this was important, whether people, respondents, thought the depicted situation was realistic. Because, well, low scores on these items would render the results quite uh, useless. Furthermore, we uh, included a num number of explanatory variables in the, uh, in the survey, and they are partly uh, um, taken from adoption diffusion theories and partly from theories on trust. Uh, so very briefly, uh, we included the variable about 
perceived effectiveness or expected impact. So that is the degree to which people uh, think uh, posting something online about an issue they encounter makes a difference or not. Um, the ease of use and the skills people possess, peer pressure that they may experience to either speak up or uh, not speak up, social media anxiety, so that is a number of items with which we try to measure whether people think that posting something online would backfire on them, so it would uh, uh, make them vulnerable. Then trust in what we call here social media ecology. That is basically what people think that safeguards exists within social, social media businesses to uh, um, uh, prevent consequences from happening at the industry level and trust in government. And we also included some controls. Um, now, basically what we did is we gathered data uh, yeah, in the form of a vignette survey and more specifically, we uh, commissioned Qualtrics to uh, gather the data in uh, some of the panels that they run. These are opt-in panels and um, it was our best try to at least um, gather some data in these eight countries uh, with some form of representativeness. And well, the first question, and that was, that was really uh, a big thing for us, is to check the realism, the reported realism levels of the, uh, of the vignettes, the stories that we depicted. Uh, and you can see them uh, depicted in the graph. And we were quite happy that well, overall, uh, these scores were kind of satisfactory. Uh, no absolute uh, criteria exist, but well, we thought that this was reason enough to carry on and to uh, pursue our uh, analysis. So um, what we did is we did some country specific regression analysis for each of the countries and a multi-level analysis to uh, actually uh, uh, do the, uh, the comparison between the countries. And uh, here you can see at least three journal publications that will appear somewhere in the next weeks or, or have already appeared in journals where uh, specific country studies are reported and some more uh, context about uh, Canada, Paraguay and China is included in the analysis. Now, uh, what I would like to do now is to report on the uh, comparative analysis, which is arguably much more interesting. Uh, so here you see the, the scores on the Likert scale that measures the adoption of social media by citizens to reach out to governments to uh, well, uh, uh, address each of the four uh, issues we um, presented them presented to them, like the pothole, the passport, the tax issue, and the vaccination issue. Um, well, at this moment, it's of course very hard to uh, come up with very definitive answers. You may see at this moment that the pothole uh, uh, example, the pothole vignette, is uh, the event that uh, triggers respondents most to use social media to, uh, uh, to raise their voice. And the tax issue and the uh, uh, passport issues are slightly less, let's say, popular. Um, uh, they trigger, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, people to reach out. If you look at countries, you may observe that uh, it is very uh, people in uh, Pakistan, Paraguay, also China, um, report that they are very likely to uh, use social media. This is not true for Canada and the Netherlands. Um, this was rather strange because we kind of expected that in democratic countries, 
people would be more willing uh, to address issues and more than perhaps in uh, authoritarian countries. But at least this graph doesn't provide uh, anecdotal evidence for that hypothesis. And in fact, uh, we carried on our analysis, uh, and I'm only reporting the uh, results of the analysis and even the simplified analysis. We didn't find a consistent pattern with differences between uh, res responses from citizens living in more democratic countries as opposed to more authoritarian countries. It doesn't make a difference. So that was kind of surprising for us. We did find um, impacts from the variables that we, um, uh, that we included. The most important, the, 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 the most important determinant uh, of uh, uh, the, the adoption of social media, we found was trust in social media ecology. So whether people thought that safeguard existed, also legal safeguards existed with respect to the functioning of social media was the most important determinant of whether people decided to use social media or not to address issues with governments. The second most important determinant was peer pressure. And well, you can see it on the slide, uh, we found a significant, significant, significant impacts from uh, uh, these variables with negative impacts from trust in government. So the more people trust government, the less likely they are, uh, they, the less like, likely they are to use social media to address specific issues online. And social media anxiety also has a negative impact, a negative significant impact. Especially trust in government was, was, was a finding that surprised us. And I'll come back to that later. So um, I'm coming slower towards the end of my presentation. Um, in terms of interpretation and discussion, if we look at a political part from a political participation perspective, I would say these results underline the importance of trustworthiness of social media platforms. So if, if, we, if we observe that social media are being used for political participation and we value political participation uh, on social media platforms, there is a need, there is a case for uh, addressing the issue of trustworthiness of social media platforms. The second comment I would like to make at this moment is that at least for well, the kind of participation we studied around the world, so for thin online participation, there are signs of a distinctive economic logic, and this uh, can be viewed from the perceived impact variable. So the idea is that people will only spend time on digital particip participation if they think their efforts will have an effect, will have an impact. Now there is this perhaps strange overall negative impact of trust in government on uh, the adoption of social media by citizens to address uh, specific issues. So this suggests that overall people do not see social media as a platform for co-production but rather as a naming and shaming platform. So it, it's, it's the less likely they are, trust, they are likely to trust the government, the more likely they are to use social media to address specific issues. And there's the issue of social media anxiety. It plays a, it plays a significant role, but the, the, the size of the impact is a bit smaller than, than we expected. So it does exist, but it doesn't play a very prominent role. Um, coming back to the context, I would say, from a, at least from, from a perspective of political participation, there is a case for regulation or perhaps self-regulation of social media platforms. So it's now being discussed. Uh, Facebook says it is open to idea of regulation. I don't know whether this is true or not. 
so in, in at least the American context uh, in the Senate, uh, proposals are being discussed to regulate social media industries. So at least from, from, from the perspective of political participation, uh, well, there, there is a, a case for, for this. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, whether it is self-regulation or regulation or whatever, which, which will work best, that for me is an empirical question. And I would like to mention at this moment that this research has focused on thin participation. Um, so only uh, participation in response to day-to-day uh, -day, uh, issues of poor public service quality. Uh, arguably more important is the issue of thick participation. So like the real issues, uh, uh, discussions about constitutions, about again, climate change, immigration, uh, whatever, uh, and how this can be explained. Uh, but this is something that is slightly more difficult to implement in a comparative study, uh, but nevertheless, it's something for future research. Um, other ideas for future research is that this study has pioneered the use of vignettes, uh, and we struggled a bit with that. Uh, so we tested it, uh, we, we designed them using uh, 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 conversations with, uh, in our case, students from all over the world to design vignettes that would appeal to a, to a very large uh, audience. Um, we tested that. We tested the uh, vignettes in also quantitative pilot studies in the Netherlands with also international students. Nevertheless, it, well, designing uh, uh, vignettes is an art in itself, uh, and uh, this is something that uh, we need to pay attention to. The second implication, or second second idea for uh, another idea for future research is that in our models, we uh, well, uh, quite uh, understandably didn't explain everything. So there is room for additional explanatory variables. So in the current uh, study, we combined more or less classic adoption and diffusion theories with theories on institutional trust, so trust in government and in trust in well, the social media industry, basically. Um, as far as we are concerned, we are thinking about uh, adding other variables that have to do with political values that respondents may or may not have, but also personality characteristics. So we think it's likely, and there is little literature that suggests it, suggests it, that personality characteristics may play a very important role in explaining why some people would uh, use social media to reach out, whereas others will not do so. Um, this is um, the research. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, and I would, we would be more than happy to discuss uh, the findings with you. Vincent, thank you so much for your super interesting talk. I think we were all quite... Uh, puzzled when you showed us that uh, the trust in government actually has a reverse link to the likelihood to participate. I think that's really something that will stir the debate also what I see already from the questions in the chat. And um, I, I would start off with this uh, point what, what got me puzzled also uh, from my past work. So I was actually rather than seeing thick participation, I was rather thinking of this concept of strong participation, which in a sense, when you explained it was uh, uh, also a bit similar to how you thought that it should be differentiated more on the topic, right? So a thin participation uh, when the issue is not so important versus a thick one uh, with, when, when it gets more serious. But uh, in that sense, I mean, the deliberative character is already included in your understanding of, of thin participation. And, and wouldn't you say so that, I'm not sure that actually social media is always very deliberative, right? So sometimes, as you said, it's only this uh, naming and shaming rather than a real uh, exchange of opinions. Yes, um, well, uh, yes, yes, uh, uh, I would agree with that. Um, but we had in this, in this study, mm -hmm. we really wanted to check whether 
adoption was different in, uh, so that was one of the uh, motivations. So whether mm -hmm. motivation would be different across specific countries, and especially would be different in more democratic countries yeah. as opposed to more authoritarian mm -hmm. contexts. Um, so that was the idea, and we yeah. wanted to at least to um, uh, have respondents in all kinds of countries respond to the same issues, at least to control sure, the sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, And therefore also in, uh, um, uh, th that, was, th that was basically uh, what we were intrigued by. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, quite, uh, quite rightly, people may have various uh, um, motivations to address issues. At, at, sometimes it's uh, to address an issue and to, to ask for a solution or more or less naming and shaming. Mm. And well, this is one of the innovations we are looking for in further developing the vignettes, mm. because I think we, we, we should uh, yeah. indeed uh, specify that in the vignettes and also check whether this plays a role, whether people are more interested in engaging in co-production, like a more positive role, Mm. or more interested in simply exposing uh, uh, low quality service. Yeah. Uh, at this moment, it's very hard to say something about it. So we, we, we were in, we triggered by this negative relation. Yeah. This is future research. Great. Thanks, Vincent. We have three uh, inputs already. So I would say the first two are related to a similar issue around how the interaction between citizens actually goes. And I would like to ask Saidi maybe to put uh, the question forward first. Are you still there? Yep. Please go ahead. Yeah. So I just want to ask you what kind of interaction actually are you trying to capture here? Because we know there is interaction just the interaction like provide a comment, provide input or something like that. And is it communication? Is it one way or two way communication that you are capturing through this research? And the second one, or did you also see the what kind of a government services delivered by, I mean, by the by the those country uh, through social media? Is it just like if you complain something, if there is broken in some part of the road in this area and they will send someone something like that or just the communication uh, interaction that you are trying to capture here? Yes. Well, thank you very much for your question. Uh -huh. uh, I think this is a very relevant question. So in this particular study, we focused on the um, initiation of a, of, a, uh, uh, of a conversation online. So a citizen is confronted with one out of four possible uh, issues, like a pothole or something went wrong with the passport or uh, with the, the, the taxes or the vaccination summon. And he or she decides to go online and to share this experience. Uh, uh, the, the question is, the question to respondents was, would you do the same, basically? So initiate the conversation raise a voice. It was not about engaging in, in an actual conversation because that is very hard to address in, in a survey. Uh, so uh, we very deliberately said something about, uh, uh, well, uh, the initiation, uh, uh, so actual uh, uh, initiation of, of uh, uh, a conversation by, by citizens. Um, and also, what we, we focused on, this is uh, also an issue that we uh, were uh, confronted with yeah. uh, that was raised by reviewers of, the, at, of some of the, the papers that uh, were now, are now available. Um, so the idea is, and it was also written down in the vignettes, that um, respondents are confronted with real life issues they they don't uh, the idea is that we ask them whether they would use social media to address those issues not whether they uh, uh would find other channels to remedy it or to address issues it was basically simply about the adoption of social media and that's a limitation 
Hey, thanks, Vincent. So we continue with the with this discussion with Meta that is actually going about citizen to citizen networks. Meta, please. Thank you. Um, as I understand, um, the interaction mechanisms are evolving in e-government, and citizens interact with within themselves and form groups, networks, and uh, these networks can be beneficial networks or they can be dark networks as reported by Albert Meyer in lynching mobs, locating and harming sex offenders and so on and so forth. So my question is, is this C2C networks, are they becoming a new e-government category in addition to G2G, G2B and G2C? Of course, they have to tie to a government to be deemed as e-government, but are we seeing an evolution, um, a new player in town, uh, so to speak? Thank you. I would also add now Biao's question to this. I, th I think it also fits nicely. Uh, and then you can give uh, the, the answers, Vincent, and maybe also some uh, round off. Biao, please. Uh, hi, Vincent. Thanks hi. for your presentation. Uh, I, I just wondering uh, whether it could be possible that, the, that your results may vary between different social media platforms in China. But for me, I'm like uh, Weibo is more top down platform, four, where it's, there might be a less space for this kind of system government interaction. Or for, but for WeChat, another you know, popular social media in China, the governments do have a very you know, official channel and uh, uh, functionality for citizens that where they can put their com complaints or something like that. So, um, so maybe the Chinese citizen could trust more about trust more the interaction between citizen and government in we we chat rather than in Weibo. So this is my uh, idea. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... Yes, well, uh, first, perhaps, well, I will try to combine giving answers to both suggestions because they, they are indeed related, I think. Uh, so, uh, yes, if, if we talk about, so in, in, in trying to address uh, Meta's issue, um, maybe what we witness here, uh, when we look from the, the angle of political participation, um, there may be a new form of, uh, indeed, uh, uh, interaction, uh, the, the C2C, perhaps citizen to citizen. So it, it's really all about mobiliza mobilization, which is C2C. And it's just, I think it's also related to uh, all kinds of hybrid forms of political protests that we are now witnessing that, that, that kind of uh, are initiated online and then uh, uh, may uh, result in actual people going out in the streets or, or whatever. So it would be a very interesting uh, uh, area to, um, to, to discover. And it, it, I think partly it has been addressed by uh, my colleagues in Rotterdam, we say something about micro mobilization. This is a, a term that Victor Beckers has used. So micro mobilization means that uh, online, so a limited number of people start talking and this, this movement grows and grows online and then goes from the, the virtual into the real world. Uh, and it has been described uh, as more or less anecdotal evidence. I think it, it, should, it, should, can, it should be produced uh, and researched further. Uh, so it's a very interesting uh, suggestion. So thank you very much. Um, and Biao's comment, um, so my understanding of the, the, the question or the, the comment is that the channel, uh, the type of social media that is being used may make a difference. And I fully understand it. And in fact, um, we are also criticized by, uh, by reviewers uh, when we submitted the, uh, the, 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 the ERAS paper about Weibo. So why focus on Weibo? It's old fashioned. Everybody is now, is now on WeChat. So why focus on this old fashioned channel? Uh, so yes, I, I, fully I can fully understand that different channels may attract various audiences and that the type of interaction on uh, various platforms is quite different. So 
well, it, I think anecdotal evidence suggests that, well, uh, uh, communication on Twitter is quite different from communication on Insta, for, exa for example. So yes, it may make a difference. I must be honest in saying that in this uh, study, in the, in the cosmic studies, cosmic study, we didn't, we deliberately didn't specify the channel because we didn't want people to, uh, we, we just asked them whether they use social media in general. Uh, so we, we, we kind of suggested that they would use the, or refrain from using the channel of their preference, the, the platform of their preference. Uh, but indeed, it may make a difference. And well, uh, the sorry answer at this moment is that this is a very, a very interesting uh, suggestion for further research. And yes, but it is very important. Yeah. I think we all got a lot of food for thought uh, from, from this talk. Thank you, Vincent, for, for sharing your time with us and, and also your thoughts. I mean, I'm looking forward uh, to the privilege we have to continue our discussions in Tartu and invite everyone else to, to use this opportunity likewise. And uh, it actually is the start of this discussion series. And I hope that we'll have Vincent maybe then in a different role also participating in the future events and also the, all the other participants also to join in. Then last, it is for me today also to uh, point you to an event that we're organizing in a similar topic uh, on disinformation in the digital age on the 26th of November, which is going to be a physical, respectively hybrid event um, that is uh, happening in the framework of the Eastern Partnership um, framework of the European Union. So I will engage with uh, countries such as uh, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Uh, and we will have an interesting discussion around uh, uh, disinformation, around foreign influence, and also including internet voting, as this is a topic that's on the rise in those countries as well. So we're looking forward to your registrations, hopefully having you also in Tartu in late November, respectively uh, participating in our online platforms there. And we have put the link also into the chat and you can also find it on the eseps.ut.de website. With that, uh, when do we have our next seminar? Uh, on 12th of November. On 12th of November, uh, we have uh, the next talk with Rune Halvorsen uh, from Oslo, Metropolitan University of Oslo. Is that correct, Biao? Yes. Then uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all there again. And thank you so much and have a great lunch break. Bye-bye.